Well, thanks for coming out at this busy week. Um, I want to reiterate again that next Friday at this time, 6 to 9, is the opening of the MFA and the MDES thesis shows. It's always a great evening. If you hear rumbles and crap, hopefully not crashes, <laughs> controlled kind of work coming through the walls, that's people working to put that show up even as we speak, and it's, it's going to be pretty spectacular, I think. Um, tonight, it's a real pleasure to have Andrea Myers with us. A lot of you know Andrea. Um, many of you have been students of hers. Uh, she's taught here at CCAD in the Fine Arts Department, the core area, in graduate studies. She's mentored a lot of graduate students. Um, and everybody, without exception, knows that Andrea's a really talented uh, and generous teacher. Um, and you probably all know, so know that she's an accomplished um, artist. She's currently an assistant professor of sculpture at Kent State University. Um, she has a BFA and MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, she has recent and upcoming exhibitions at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Hyde Park Art Center, Evanston Art Center, Toledo Museum of Art, the Columbus Museum of Art, Co Galleries in Berlin, uh, Gallery Klaus Braun in Stuttgart, um, Textil und Rendsport Museum in Holstein, Germany. She's been awarded numerous grants and fellowships and is represented by Hammond Harkins um, in Columbus, uh, GUT Gallery in, in Dallas, and McCormick Gallery in Chicago. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> but most importantly, she is a, a kind and generous an extremely talented artist. So please join me in welcoming her. Thanks for the kind introduction and um, thanks for taking the time to come out and um, hear about my work, especially during this busy time. Um, and putting together this PowerPoint, this is about um, 15 to 20 years of my work, which feels a little overwhelming to try and encapsulate in the next 40, 45 minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> So I don't know if we want to turn the lights down a yeah, little bit. Yeah, show you how to do it? No. They show me how <laughs> sometimes even I always forget. <laughs> <laughs> I can just start pushing things. Oh, there we go. Doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Rick! Oh, it's not Thanks, Rick. That's true. So just to kind of start off and talk about the themes that I'll be touching on in my work um, that have been of interest over the last 15 or 20 years that I've been working since going through undergrad. Um, kind of focused on being a, a maker, and I, I see that as the space between mediums, so not fully 2D, not fully 3D, but this kind of space between 2, two and a half D, as I had an advisor once call it. Um, also working from flat materiality to form, so um, I'm going to talk about the fact that I started as a printmaker and uh, um, in my undergrad time, and so when I went to start working sculpturally, I was looking at materials that were flat to then build an accumulation. So that would be <coughs> fabric, paper, wood, and also working in additive and subtractive processes. Also, I have an interest in kind of this idea of facades. So how um, you know there's. Um, a facade to a painting or a facade to a sculpture, but what's the kind of internal and external life of an object and how can I kind of play with that, that space and that tension. And then just kind of a deep love for formalism, so um, looking to color, texture, shape, and scale in my work and as, as my subject matter. Um, and then also looking at abstractions of everyday observations, so pulling from the natural world and natural landscapes urban environments, depending on where I'm living or, or residencies that I've done, um, pulling from emotional states, looking at objects that could imply some kind of transition or shift in their objecthood, and then also just kind of pulling from human experience and human imperfection and, and doing that via abstraction. So I kind of laid out here if I had to, and I've talked to students about this before, of like what my art family tree would be or who are the artists that I, I find inspiration or align myself with. And so this is just a collection of people that I've um, kind of continued to love over time. So Polly Applebaum, Eva Hess, Richard Tuttle, Lee Bontecu, Louise Bourgeois, and Robert Morris. And I have kind of some words that when I'm looking at their work, I think about their, how they use accumulation or the voids in their work, gravity, malleability, 
contrast in materials, their relationships that they build between the floor and the wall, maybe thinking about them as painterly sculpture, and also just kind of general accumulation or, or also a, a collage <coughs> aesthetic that is also um, in my work. Um, I actually started my undergraduate and my high school to undergraduate as thinking I was going to be a, a writer, an English major, <clears throat> and it, that kind of shifted midway through, and I ended up transferring to the School of Art Institute of Chicago for my undergrad and also finished grad school there. But um, I tend to think of words as one of my materials also, um, thinking of the Richard Serra verb list and how he used that to generate pieces that would um, impart, you know, the to remove, to... Um, disarranged, open, he's kind of just making these lists. So I found myself in grad school especially making a lot of lists of not necessarily like actions but dualities or tensions, um, polarities that I was interested in and you'll see that in some of my work. And then also looking at the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings and um, as you'll notice in my titling of my work I like to uh, play with words and manipulate them and kind of smash them together or be poetic with my titling to imply some human emotive voice in the work even though they're abstract forms. <clears throat> and then I thought I'd include the fact that maybe it's not as evident in the, the sculptures or the final pieces that I create but I'm um, constantly or, or quite often drawing out ideas for compositions or forms, interactive forms. Um, I've been keeping a sketchbook since um, probably undergraduate time. And so just I, for me, and I, I, something I stress to students is that, that archive of ideas so that I'll find myself drawing something repeatedly that, you know, finally I'll get, you know, it's in my mind's eye and that I finally get to the point where I make the object, or um, it's just a kind of testing ground for me in terms of forms that I'm inventing and, and relationships I'm building within my sketchbook. And a lot of them just end up being black line drawings and stay at that, but more recently I've started adding in color to my drawings to kind of figure out what, what my composition's going to look like. So here's an example of most of them staying just simple black and white line drawings. But then um, you know, adding in color so that I can kind of get an understanding of, of how I want to approach the objects that I'm, I'm making. And I was talking to somebody recently about my drawings and, and she was saying how I use a lot of black in my textile works and it kind of made me start thinking about like, well, that's almost in a way me drawing within my textile works. So I have a range here of earlier works from um, the kind of the first part of my grad school experience, which I... I always like to show people who are in school, like the work that I was doing while I was in school and how it's changed and evolved over time. I think it's, for me, it's interesting as an artist to see people's early work. So like I said, I um, got my BFA and from School Art Institute of Chicago in print media studies. So I was doing a lot of um, screen printing and intaglio, but I was also taking fiber classes at the same time when I was finishing my undergrad. And then I loved their program so much that I went back um, and got my grad degree there in 2004 to 2006. Um, just being really attracted to the fiber department because it was so open-ended. There were people there that were doing performance and sculpture and painting, and so it wasn't so specific. That material studies, I think, is the, the loophole in the whole program of just being really interdisciplinary and, and learning how to be a maker and go off your ideas versus um, being kind of feeling like you're, you're um, confined to, to one material. So these are examples where I was exploring kind of this uncontrollability of nature that I was interested in, or um, kind of that floor-wall relationship, how to build sculptural forms. Since I had that printmaking background, I wasn't necessarily like a confident sculptor in a way, so I was using the materials that I knew to, to build and accumulate over time, but specific to these moments of uncontrollability in nature. Um, so this is one piece, an example of that's like one of the first pieces I did in grad school, where I was cutting out repetitions of a shape and kind of thinking about like a spill or um, maybe like a frozen land or icicles or something like that, that could just be this abstraction of, of a landscape that could be kind of folded back and forth into itself. So that had this um, change or ability to change and be malleable over time. Um, 
also, like, I think this also began my interest in kind of thinking about micro and macro moments in nature, and so maybe drawing into like a, a fallen wasp's nest and kind of like it, it breaking and coming over. So I was just feeling like an inventive about use of color and form um, and having some, some kind of order and chaos and that tension between the two. And then there was like a really big shift that happened in my work in my second year of grad school where I felt like um, I was kind of pigeonholing myself into it being overly specific about um, this the natural world. So as an exercise for myself, I decided to start doing really pared down collages, focusing on just the material of fabric and wood and color. I painted my um, studio floor white to kind of create this tableau space where I was making sculptural paintings in a way that then kind of the interest being then when I photograph these two objects together, they start flattening down so that the collage on the left is fabric, and then the collage on the right, I um, rendered out of wood to match that first kind of gestural collage. So I was interested in that kind of the, these tensions of um, making a quick collage and then rendering something slowly and methodical out of wood, or this one was made out of cardboard. Um, but I think this is where I start started to kind of build my <clears throat> confidence and vocabulary and just that I could be in love with form and color and scale and that those formal qualities and that's okay, that it didn't have to always be so obvious what the content or the concept was. Um, so I, I think for me these pieces were a huge turning point and I think are still impacting my work and it was a way to kind of like trust myself that I could level out my um, body of work in a way and rebuild it and, and find my specific voice in that way. Um, and there's a couple examples then where, again, like I said at the beginning, like these tensions or opposites or polarities, so setting up these um, scenes where maybe one would be rigidly standing even though that's the fabric, and then the piece in the background has kind of fallen apart, but that's the one made out of wood. So I guess um, kind of pushing at the expectations of the materiality also. Um, and then this one was kind of the doing the collage on the floor um, and thinking about this title or, or concept of waxing and waning and cutting the perimeter of the circle. So that's kind of like the thinnish, thinnest option of this piece next to the kind of fullest option of the piece. <coughs> um, so I think through doing those, it, I was able to start building back up my work kind of in my own terms and less um, reliant on source imagery or source materials in that way um, and also thinking more in terms of an installation and so imagining these fissures or um, things coming out of the studio wall and that middle image of this piece um, is pretty important because I also began slowly layering and accumulating just a little bit of fabric coming off the wall and so that was a direction that my, my work started going in as well. Also these are collages that I made um, <coughs> just with glue and fabric. And so later on, there's a point where my work, I start integrating the sewn line into it. But these were just very quick and gestural um, exercises in a way. Um, and this piece, um, Isthmus, again, like going back to that kind of like word prompts or title prompts. So I was thinking about landscape still, and that an Isthmus is this, um, body of land that connects two larger bodies of land, which would be the, the studio walls. Um, but again, it's like inventing my for the forms on my own terms and figuring out how to access abstraction as an artist. I think that's kind of just like using my materials and color to start building forms. Um, and then as I started playing around with compiling fabric, just coming up with objects that were sh solely layered fabric and I use a lot of I use a lot of felt during this time um, has that nice kind of um, thickness to it and made it really <clears throat> lush striations in the work um, and all of these I mean it's hard when you're seeing them projected on a large screen but all of them are kind of like a also like a domestic or kind of medium-sized scale so I was also thinking about like always thinking about body scale and how they relate to the body 
um, in that scale where it kind of feels like a bodily scale, but not overwhelming. <clears throat> this was a piece that I did. I worked with a gallery in Chicago that rep represented me for a while, right out of grad school, called Lisa Boyle Gallery. And she invited um, all the artists to make responsive works based off of playing the video game Katamari. And um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, if you know me, I, I don't like playing video games. I didn't grow up playing video games, so I like just was watching them play. But I was struck <laughs> with um, how the, the objects were compiling on each other in the video game. So, um, and again, I think this is one of the first pieces, maybe also related to the, the fissure piece in my studio where I'm thinking about that in, internal and external life of an object and how I can create this really visceral contrast between the two. Um, and then at the end of grad school, this is kind of an ongoing series. If you know my work, I've been working on this series since 2006. Um, but with my printmaking background and thinking about um, the picture plane, and I was taking the train a lot in Chicago and looking, watching um, how there were a lot of billboards that had been painted over, and I, I would notice that there were little kind of like peeled away areas where they, the paint didn't get totally saturated over the old billboards. So I was really interested in that kind of concealment and revealment of this process that I was noticing just happening, weathering mm -hmm. in an urban environment. Um, so I started thinking about like, well, how could I emulate that through dimensional means? And I um, began open screen printing on, on paper. I have some examples of images of it, but just fields of color on sheets of paper that I'll then glue around the edges of the block of paper. So the middle of the, of the pieces remain open and flexible. So then I'll cut into the middle of them and then tear away. So it's a very um, improvisational process where I don't really remember where the colors are embedded, although I've gotten better at kind of thinking strategically like how I'm embedding the color. But so that these color combinations emerge through this um, reductive sculptural process. And I've, since it's been an ongoing series and it's maintained my in interest, I've played around with like, the scale of them, or the, like I said, the color combinations, making those voids that are pulling the viewer in. And I think that's a reoccurring theme in my work as well. Um, just like how am I kind of pulling at the viewer and pulling in a focal point um, to break that, that distance that the viewer has and it becomes about this absorption into the work. And I'll do the processes where I'll paint on the back of the paper so that it becomes this reflective color, which relates to an um, installation I'll show you later in the presentation. Or then, so these pairings, again, like, I'm really attracted to these dualities or, or having um, diptychs interact with each other. Um, and so this is the one, one where it's the, the uh, paint's on the back of the page, paper and on the, on the other side, the, the fluorescence on the front. And just to feel that different resonance that the pieces can have. So I've done a lot of different combinations and thinking about, you know, having like this black, darker layers, almost kind of like um, darker skies in a way, or portals. Um, and just really exploring like all these different possibilities with this series. Uh, and um, the next slide too is thinking again, like how can I go from the, the largest version of a piece to the smallest version? So this kind of this micro version of them, um, and I see these very much as like a physical drawing that I do over time, and they very much embed like a, a time element where they're this kind of layering, compiling, and then a removal process. So it is much in line with those billboards and, and um, signs that have been painted over and over again, that same kind of weathering process. And then I just have images of um, um, doing commissions for domestic spaces where my process has gotten a, um, I mean, I still will do the stacks of paper where it's like a big, thick stack of them, but I've also kind of learned how to cheat my own process. So I have all these leftover remnants of um, pieces that I've created and so I've, they've, they've become thinner where I can make larger scale ones and have them be thin. I can show you the process images. So, um, and I mentioned earlier, and I'll, I'll keep mentioning throughout my presentation that I um, use and reuse a lot of my scrap materials. Um, 
So as I'm generating paper and um, doing the open painting on um, printmaking paper and tearing away, I'll have all these kind of leftover scraps. And it's really hard for, I mean, for a while I just didn't throw them away, and, but not knowing what to do with them. It's really hard to kind of like be making this material for your work and then just throw it away. So um, I, I saved them and then I started thinking about how I could reuse them and, and make kind of these, these units that I could then embed into the larger sheet of, of paper. So um, just kind of playing with my own process and pushing back against my own process and, and the idea of facades also. <laughs> so um, I'll next talk a little bit about the residency experiences that I've had after I was done with graduate school. So like a lot of people, when you're leaving graduate school, you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. And I had found a position where it was a visiting artist position at Central Michigan University, but I was, which was great, but I was really attracted to the fact that they let you stay in this Frank Lloyd Wright-inspired house in the middle of the woods for a year, um, especially since I'd been living in Chicago for you know seven or eight years. And so I wanted to look for that contrast of going from like a very urban setting to a very, very remote setting to see you know, what, what would happen with me and my work. Um, so this was one of the, this was actually the first sewn piece that I made of the fabric collage. And just kind of looking at it, I lived by a river and so thinking about kind of the, the, the movement and flow of the natural world, but also starting to think like, well, I could use the sewing machine as a drawing tool and work in sections and sew them together so that the surface of the um, textile pieces begins to undulate and become very sculptural. And also, it, it also um, makes kind of like an uncontrollable element that I have to kind of fight in the sewing machine some of the time when I'm working on them. This is another piece that I made while I was in Michigan. Um, and much like uh, painting on the open sheets of paper, I began doing open screen printing on large sheets of fabric um, and then compiling those and cutting back into to create that, again, that void and the swirl of color. Um, and then the piece in the background is actually leftover pieces. It's a collage, but a left leftover pieces from one of my paper pieces. So again, like kind of always going back to this relationship between um, objects I'm presenting and physical space and then the wall and those relationships and kind of conversations that my pieces can have with each other. And then I made a series of small sculptures that were the cutaways from that large floor piece. Um, and I began layering those and just slowly in accumulation <coughs> to create these organic forms where I kind of had an idea of like what the form would look like, but I allowed the material to just evolve and accumulate to create these um, organic forms. And this is an example of the, just showing the, the armature support on the inside is just um, foam like you would use for a seat on a chair. And so I'll build units of the layered fabric and then kind of slowly mold them around the foam on the inside and just kind of like gradually growing them much like something in nature would grow. And so these are some other variations. These are actually <coughs> the, um, like small table top size sculptures. Um, another thing that I think happens in my work too is kind of thinking about saturation to desaturation or how color can kind of bleed or shift within a piece of that I'm making. Um, and also that they become anthropomorphic in a way, or how can they be sighted in the gallery space, and maybe they're seeming to crawl or move off of the pedestal or off of the, the wall. Um, then, I, so I went back to Chicago, and then I was looking for more <laughs> remote residencies, just trying to figure out like what I was gonna do after grad school, and um, I was invited to participate in, the, in um, Changing Landscapes Residency as part of Studio in the Woods in New Orleans, and they were interested in artists coming in and, and responding to the post-Katrina landscape. <clears throat> a Studio in the Woods, much like its name implies, it was started by two founders, and it's in a more rural area of New Orleans, but it's pretty, pretty um, close to the city. So I had proposed to come and do something more experimental in my work, where it was going to be site-specific, outdoor, obviously not permanent. These were just pieces of plywood that I cut and then covered with mylar so that I was 
interested in like maybe evoking like a broken terrain or a broken mirror, <clears throat> but also thinking about like what was going to be reflecting into the piece. And then simultaneously, I was just um, again like looking at the um, environment around me as inspiration for abstractions. So I was working on more textile pieces while I was there, and looking at the um, walking the river every day on the levee, which is really just a simplistic mound, a hill, <coughs> and observing the the waterway and the ships that were coming and going, and also like. Kind of, I, I also oftentimes try to balance out some of my more um, labor-intensive pieces with quick exercises, or these were some collages that I made with all the, again, like remnants that are cut away from the other pieces I'm working on, so how can I kind of make these quick um, tactile drawings in a way with the sewing machine and, and remnant fabric. Um, and then, uh, 2015, I went to, um, the Mark Rothko Art Center and Dagopils Latvia, which I, um, actually Julia Abijanik who teaches here, she and I went and we had, had both applied and not even knowing that we both had applied and so <laughs> here we are, two people from Columbus, but there's uh, another woman from New York and everyone else was from um, Europe, but it was a textile symposium um, and it was for two weeks and it, this is a Mark Rothko Museum that's in Latvia and they also have residency programs and again like I was noticing the patterning and the more definitely brutal landscape, especially when you go to uh, Eastern Europe in November, it's super gray and like I have to like weather that it was like, you think that Columbus is gray, but it, it, there's a place that is grayer <laughs> in the world. So, um, and it was uh, kind of bleak in a way because like the, the rooms were gray, the studio walls were gray, the, all the studio walls were also curved, so it was kind of problematic, but um, we did some workshops and and presentations, but uh, what was really interesting is that it was on this old fortress site, and so there were ruins and um, untouched areas, and um, so I, I I felt the landscape and the the kind of fallen architecture were starting to impact some of the patterning and and textiles that I was beginning to to make while I was there, and so I was there for two weeks. And then these are two of the pieces that, larger pieces that I made while I was there. And again, like photographed on a gray wall, photographed on the floor because I couldn't find a wall big enough. <laughs> but, um, and this is an interesting residency that I did in 2016, um, work in progress textile residency at the Textile Art Center in New York. So basically they have you come and set up um, your studio in their, in their window space and you can work there as much or as little as you want and then we held workshops, um, but it was a great kind of way to get engaged in the New York community. And you know, as I've now kind of been more um, not not living in Chicago, I find myself wanting to go travel to cities more because it's, so it's like balancing out my kind of quiet with the the noise of a of a city. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about commission work that I've done and how that relates to my practice. So. Um, 2009, I was, I was <clears throat> got a commission through like a, a person. At a, I worked at restaurants, and so it was like uh, someone who was coming to the restaurant, and she got me connected um, to do these lobby space pieces. First, it was just going to be one, and then I decided to do two. So it was a really good push for my work. Of I had done these textile pieces, but not at the scale that they were looking for, and of course. Um, they always want things quicker than you could ever think you could make them, so it was a very short time frame, but I, I made two large um, collages and then went and installed them in the lobby space. And also it was just like a time for me to figure out, these. this is bamboo paneling, and so it's so dense that you can't drill into it, so I had to figure out how to um, install it in between the, the panels. And so that was like, there's always, I'm sure a lot of you know there's always some kind of weird challenge that comes up when you're working site specifically or installing things, um, but it's all this kind of learning process about your work. Um, and then I got contacted by this fiber company, Antron Fiber. They make carpet um, fibers, and they were looking for an artist to make landscape-inspired installations in their upcoming showroom in Chicago for um, NeoCon, which is a big design fest that happens. 
and they had 900 miles of, you can see in the bottom left, 900 miles of this textile or this fiber material from their previous showroom that they wanted an artist to come in and repurpose, reuse, and form into these um, environmentally inspired niches that they had in their showroom. And then also I ended up doing large wall pieces as well. So these are just my little sketches and um, uh, inspiration images that I came up with to generate the proposal. And then these are the installed pieces that were, I, I ended up um, dyeing a lot of the fiber. They had specific colors that they wanted that were their kind of brand colors at the time. I used um, chicken wire as a, a backer and then just was <coughs> weaving and wrapping the chicken wire. And so talking about installation <coughs> challenges, the, the walls of the showroom, I don't know if you can tell, but they're curved and they're also made out of fabric. So, and Kira is here and she was my intern. Um, she helped me install, but we're having to stitch and like lean to install them because of the curve of the wall and like the install window is really short. So there's always some kind of fun, stressful thing that comes into the com commission installations. Um, so this was one that, this was a commission that had recently, and I actually have another one coming up through the Dayton Metro Library System. But this was one where I saw an RFP, a request for proposals, and I, I was interested in the fact that they are looking, and they're doing it, rebuilding all their libraries and putting two to five, at least, I think, art pieces within each library. But they are partnering with the Dayton Art Institute, and so they put forward in the call, here are some art pieces from our collection that we want artists to respond to as inspiration for work that's going to be in the library. So. Um, one, for, for the main branch, they had one of the options is Monet water lilies. Um, but I was just kind of struck, and I, I think I, I stuck with that one because I wasn't really fond of the other ones, but I was struck with the idea of like, well, I can kind of, you know, the impressionistic kind of intention I have in my work sometimes of these, these strips of fabric that I can then collage together and make these cloud or lily pad forms or these abstractions that relate back to it. So this is um, installed in the main branch. Then I have a couple examples of outdoor pieces that I've done around Columbus that were made out of um, exterior grade plywood. And again, like these are opportunities where I just saw a call and it's, you know, just kind of curious if I can actually do it or not, or maybe uh, creating problems in my work to solve. So um, this was a, a call where they were looking for artists to create letter boxes, which is a geocaching, um, and I, I wasn't even familiar with what that all meant, but basically it's like kind of like a hide and seek of objects through GPS tracking. Um, and so I, I put a proposal up for um, something that was evocative of the, the slate deposits around the park that it was going to be installed in. So I just have some images of, kind of my I, idea, um, kind of, generation of, of just quick sketches of the site visit then again like going back to what I know with like flat materials to build that dimensionality and then I inserted a, a box in the middle of it so that the um, the stamp and the, the pad of paper that are supposed to be in there could be hidden away for the geocaching exercise <clears throat> I also did um, a, a non-permanent part of this uh, exhibition that Michael Marcel curated called Hungry Planet at Franklin Park Conservatory. Um, and I proposed to do this abstracted um, apple core. The whole theme of the show was just about food s systems and sustainability, and they were looking for just like a wide range of art. So again, it's like I look a lot at a lot of different calls and propose away and then just kind of see what happens. And then it's, you know, it's, it's a really great um, example of just like, putting yourself out there to try and figure out like, well, can I, can I do this? I've never done an outdoor piece. What, what, is, what would that look like in my terms of my work? <coughs> so then going back to some of my um, sculptural forms that have been developing over the last few years, um, this, again, like I start with a lot of drawings and thinking about the objects in the gallery space and the pedestal as this iconic object 
but imagining this internal life of the pedestal and, and it's rupturing open and what, you know, much like a, a kind of a, a surrogate or stand in for human experience of, of us kind of having our facades and then what's that kind of internal energy or life that we have inside of us. Um, and also that contrast of the soft um, layers of fabric with the exterior hard shell of the, the cube. And this is a related piece and I like to show in progress um, work. So uh, my, my kind of like thinking about that micro macro thing again of an everlasting gobstopper kind of striations <laughs> <laughs> versus how it's formally similar to the layers of the earth. Um, and then make, wanting to make a sculpture that has that same kind of sensibility of these concentric circles that are um, coming up out of that, that exterior and that contrast of internal and external life. So I like to show these progress images because I was living above a restaurant in Chicago at the time. And so as artists, we have to be really adaptive. And I would, while they were closed in the morning, I would go down and cut the polystyrene layers and like there's an image of using one of their outdoor tables as basically like a clamp to help glue the layers together um and for a while like these lower images i think they thought it, they thought i was building like a kiddie pool or something <laughs> <laughs> so like again like sometimes as an artist you're doing really weird things in the world and it's just kind of like yeah it's fine like don't, like, don't worry about what i'm doing um and then there was like a garage that I was storing it in. And then I had my daughter, she was, I think, six months old at the time. Um, so that's like a nice like scale um, image there. But And then here's it installed in the gallery with one of my textile pieces. I should have included it, but the gallerist also, it's just so funny, she has a son about the same age, and she did that same photo of like him sitting in the piece too. So everyone is calling out for some kind of interaction with <laughs> the public. <laughs> but. Um, and then here is another related piece again of kind of imagining like these breaks of that facade to reveal some kind of internal life to an object so like i said at the beginning of the presentation that like how do we show like the human side of things the imperfection or but that can be like a, a beautiful capacity that we have this human quality to ourselves um, and this is an example of a room select project that melissa Woglywoods, who's here um, did in 2013, so coming into abandoned houses around Columbus and working site responsibly um, and the location that she gave my group and I curated a group of us had all these existing holes in the wall and so I was really drawn to that in terms of like imagining that there is almost like the, t the telltale heart kind of thing, Poe thing happening where there's these this internal life of the house coming out of these existing ruptures in the in the space. Um, and then these are examples of just going with the accumulation of layers and form without kind of coming out, out of the pedestal even more and showing that movement and um, shift in the objects. And I'm kind of I'm interested in how I can portray a movement or life in an object even though they're, they're static forms and they're static materials. And again, that interplay between the, the floor and the wall and the layers kind of, my titling, you know, slip slump like this, almost like this painting that slid down the wall and just kind of resting on the floor. So and there's a lot of personification, I feel like, happens in my work via abstraction and feeling like I can be pretty playful with that. Uh, and I have a few sculptures where I started, like again, I'm kind of always questioning my processes or, or trying to kind of hybridize them. So looking at my sewn collage work as a means to put that as a, as a facade onto sculptural objects. And so the skin that can rest on top of the, the form. And creating kind of like these tension of objects and the, the um, cube on the right is kind of smashed down. And I think I sent it to a gallery and they were really concerned that it had gotten damaged. <laughs> like, no, that's what it's supposed to, it's supposed to be half this collapse to it. And that's, you know, but so it's okay. <laughs> um, this was a project that I did through, I think it was through GCAC. It was a, called Cap Up and they took existing storefronts and invited artists, that, um, empty storefronts and invited artists to do responsive works within the storefronts. Um, so again, just showing kind of like, I like to show the armatures and just the simple means that I, that I 
try and figure out how to make a sculpture that's going to be really large with just some kind of wood armature, chicken wire, um, and then go from there. Uh, this is a more recent wood piece, but again, that kind of painting in the saturation that leads kind of into this portal or void in, into the work, um, but with these very light layers of wood and negative space in between them. And then this was a pretty recent project that I did last spring. Um, I have to say that I don't I haven't been working as sculpturally um, more recently because it, it's hard to find storage for your sculptures and, and also I, I think I've been drawn more to kind of the two-dimensional um, graphic images that I want to portray in my textile works, but I do seek out opportunities to make really large, strange sculptures that I, you know, through funding, so this um, curated storefront project, which I think they're going to get funded again for this year through the Knight Foundation, but this was another um, organization where they're taking abandoned storefronts in Akron and having artists come in and do installations. So it was a funded opportunity for me to do something that maybe I wouldn't normally do, just given the, the size and um, kind of the, the scope of the work. But it had been an image that I had drawn kind of repeatedly, so to be able to figure out, like, well, how am I going to make this large strain kind of two... Um, um, forms interacting. Uh, so you can see the process of I started with the tops of the forms that are made out of polystyrene and plaster and then um, did some paper mache work and covered that in canvas and, and painting it and also working in the garage space. <laughs> so it's again like finding where you can work um, and then here is it installed in the in the window space and um, I did not finish the back of this piece and so I would like to be able to show it at some point in the round um, and, and be, have people be able to walk around it because that's the only downside of doing something where it's just kind of captured in a, in a window space is that the viewer interaction is very limited and kind of um, contained off. So hopefully in the future I can reshow this piece. Um, so now I can talk a little bit more about my textile works and that collage process that I've been working on over time um, and I have some um, examples to show of, of larger scale projects that I've done with this but so I start incrementally again like very much a lot of my work is kind of like building of these units and then accumulating collaging together growing pieces so you see kind of the, the portions that I'll start with the middle image is the back side of the piece so they all kind of start in these small sections and then get sewn together and then there's a, a finished piece over on the right. Um, a related process, although I haven't been doing it as much, but again, like I w can't bring myself to throw things away, so I'll compile all these little bits of remnants from uh, cutting away sculptures or textile pieces. And so at some point I started just taking those and using a backing fabric and sewing them through uh, the sewing machine and they became very, very sculptural and tactile. And much like those sculptures I showed earlier, it's kind of like letting them grow organically over time. Um, and this piece I worked on, as it says, like two years, just on and off, and it's like kind of generating the, the remnants and then going and working on that piece. and. That was kind of an interesting exercise in itself um, to have the patience to kind of let something grow that large for that long amount of time and kind of see how it shifted as the time passed. So again, like there's this element of, of residue of time in my work. Um, and then these are some examples of getting a little more graphic and specific, but using still abstractions of these webs, webbed forms. Um, and that interplay of cutting away negative space and maintaining positive space in the, in the top portions of the pieces. Which also relates to these as smaller exercises, thinking again about these relationships, um, conversations between two pieces, or maybe even like a cause and effect thing that's happening within the piece, like the piece on the right. And color placement, so is there like kind of a, a burst of color or a uh, lack of color and how that's um, uh, influencing the viewer's perspective or perception of the piece. And this is a larger scale piece. And again, this one was one I kind of worked on a, on a large, longer period of time. 
but started thinking about like how can I move again like the color saturation to have it be kind of gray and then going over to the right and having more white so that visual movement that I can do with just layers and and um, the placement of color within the pieces and um, yeah so again like thinking about how can I put the color in certain areas and have that desaturation happening? But just playing with the form and um, and the placement of the color and how I'm collaging together the different strips of fabric. Um, this one is the one that I made in Latvia. And so looking at the black line that's running through the piece, again, much like the drawings that I did, to then maybe push the viewer in and out of the piece. Um, and this also playing with the scale, so becoming more panoramic in scale, so that when you're in person with the piece, you're more consumed with all the different colors happening. Um, then these are some, some recent sketches where I think my textile pieces now have become, like I mentioned, more graphic and more specific about the outcome versus like letting them just kind of gradually grow. <clears throat> so coming up with an idea for a piece and then slowly executing that composition. So I guess it's kind of becoming, it's more of like a, a painterly or could be seen as a more painterly approach to my compositions with them. I've also started doing um, or integrating a lot of dyed material and thinking about like how can I just play with that level of saturation by making my own color choice or color um, baths to dye the fabric versus relying on found colors. Um, and also using paint directly into the pieces, like the bottom of Cloud Clear has some um, fluorescent paints painted directly onto it, or going back in with the dye and, and using the dye as a paint. Um, <clears throat> and also like breaking the picture plane and having that high contrast between the background and foreground. Um, and that, again, like these form interactions and how things are intersecting or relating to each other in the picture plane. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about collaborations and curation and kind of the intersection of, of both of those things. Um, so I was invited to do a collaboration with Jeffrey Hayes from Ohio State um, as part of an, uh, an exhibition called In League at Urban Art Space, which so they, um, it was uh, Michael Goodson at the time took one CCAD faculty person and one OSU faculty person and put us together. And I think a lot of the other pairs knew each other and Jeff and I didn't know each other, but they were just kind of like, oh, I think their work would be interesting. And so he's, he is interested in the motive quality of space, obviously with interior design and how you can create an emotional impact through the use of space. So it was a great opportunity for me to think um, in a very large architectonic scale in my work. Um, so we looked to my process of layering um, flat sheets of color, but then we were thinking about like, well, how can we do this on a larger scale and also use reflective color and light interplay within the piece. So you can see all our model and, and test um, things that we were doing, but we ended up using a steel wire mesh and paper macheing those um, 16 panels. And then we painted one side white and the other side super saturated color so that when they were installed, um, all the color that it was perceived was reflective color from the, the backs of the panel. And we tore, much like my paper pieces, my small paper pieces, we tore a large cavity running through all of the, the layers. And then at some point, as we're talking and figuring out the piece, we start thinking about like, well, wouldn't it be interesting if you could see, you know, no one's gonna see the cavity, so how could we make the audience or the viewer see the cavity that's in the piece? So we came up with this idea to install a grid of mirrors underneath the piece, um, which, this was, you know, I'm always thinking about photo documentation in my work, and this was one of the first pieces I made where I felt that it was so much better in person. I think the documentation does a fair justice to it, but to be able to walk around the mirrors and kind of looking in, you're looking into this hole in the ground that doesn't even exist, and then the color, the reflective color is changing as you're walking around, and the light is um, changing as you're walking around. So really started opening up some different, um, 
thought processes in my work and just that openness of collaboration, um, you know, being able to like be a little selfless in the collaboration process and invite other ideas, I think is just really a really healthy exercise for artists. Um, so in 2015, we reinstalled at Hammond Harkins Gallery here in Columbus, and we had talked, you know, after we made that piece, we had talked about like, it'd be so great to um, be able to reinstall it vertically so that it was very um, similar, the, the macro version of my paper pieces, which you see the, the paper pieces, the small, small on the right hand side. Um, and then also it was interesting that when you were kind of walking around the back side of it, you could also see all this painted color, which previously you really couldn't see the layers, but now we were, we were revealing the process through this, um, how this was installed. So the uh, gallery also took a time lapse of the piece. So we had anticipated, you know, some of it, we had directed light to it, knowing that we were going to be reflecting the color on the piece, but we didn't anticipate fully, I don't think, that the ambient light from just the, the day to night shift would make the piece that much more saturated, especially against that back wall. It just was glowing super yellow during that time. Um, so it's nice to see that that transition in the piece as well. So it's, again, it's like you can kind of plan all these things out and think how a piece is going to go, but there's always these kind of happy surprises that happen as you're reinstalling or installing pieces. <coughs> Um, then in 2017, the gallery invited us to come up with a, another collaboration based around their 20th anniversary. Um, and then I was also curating the artists that were going to be in the exhibition as well. So Jeff and I talked a lot back and forth about something to install in the gallery. And this are, these are just the, the plans and the model for it. But what we ended up doing was taking a 20 by 20 foot sheet of this um, Dr. Shrink plastic wrap material that's used for wrapping boats or houses, shrink wrapping them, it's heat sensitive, um, and building a grid into that surface through a sewing machine and also manipulating the surface through heat guns and cutting and so we wanted it to kind of be the, the 20 by 20 referencing the 20 years that the gallery had been going, but also um, abstractly thinking about just uh, demarcation of time or a grid or maybe memories um, as these indication points along the grid. There's Anita that I told you your picture's going to be. <laughs> um, so as we're working on this, I have a video here. So one of the things that Jeff came up with, you know, as, as a sewer, it's like, you, through a sewing machine, you're, you're running the fabric through the machine, but with such a large expanse of material, what we decided on is we need to be able to physically move the sewing machine, so not move the material. <laughs> so this is like what happens when you work with a designer, he's like, comes up with these, these schemes. So he built like this little wooden car and we taped it to it. <laughs> and it would break. And it was it was pretty unruly, um, but um, so we ended up in just folding the the material as we went to create that grid. And then you can see Jeff in the bottom right. You know we were, we were like standing in the piece and cutting it and heating it with heat guns. So being really um, aggressive with the material. Um, and so here's some install shots. And then another pretty interesting thing about the material then, and something that appeals to me working in textiles and when I do these large scale installations and I've done this quite often is the beauty of it is you can just fold it up into like a four foot square object, <laughs> bring it to the gallery very unassumingly, like here's our piece. <laughs> and then, but then we unfurled it and mapping it out and so trying to also like I like that image of the hands kind of passing through the piece because we had to work around the existing um, light tracks and build it very you know site specific to the gallery and so you can see that there's these color moments in the piece so then one of the things we were trying to get out and pull out of the piece was this color reflection happening on the inside of the piece. So it's, again, it's that inside-outside relationship. Um, 
Also, the gallery coordinated having a, a dancer, um, Colleen Leonardi, come in and do some responsive work um, for one night interpretive dance to the piece. And I felt like she was really responsive to this. This is, a, I guess Jeff called it a, a metronome that he, it's like his like Duchampian thing with the bicycle wheel and there's a drill that was making the LED light on this pole. It's very like um, haphazard in a way, but human, you know, this kind of human strange movement to it. So Colleen was very much responding to the site, but also the, the light that was changing as this metronome, which again is like that time passing element that we wanted to have in the piece because of this 20th anniversary and, and showing that moment in time. But um, there's just an excerpt, excerpt of her performance of the piece, which was pretty great. And again, like working collaboratively or working site specifically, um, I never would have, or working with the galleries, like I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought to necessarily incorporate a dancer into the into the project so it's nice to have that collaboration so the other artists that were curated into the exhibition that I chose um, for this theme of soft geometries um, and I can read the curatorial statement that I wrote to just kind of get the idea of like what I was getting after with choosing these artists so drawing lines without a ruler eyeballing measurements and inventing new mergers of geometric forms with the human hand the artists featured in soft geometries from organized forms and inject with the presence of playful imperfection some of the artists working with subtle shifts some more overt through the lens of abstraction structures and systems in the artist's works soften and become pliable tactile imagined and dissolve into newly invented spaces on a micro macro scale the resulting group exhibition brings attention to the soft grid an intersection of analytical systems filtered through a subjective human experience and interplay between left and right brain spaces. So I was looking at artists and thinking about the soft grid and um, abstraction and again like how the human element is coming in and the human hand is apparent in all of these artists work. Um, and then here's some again like I go back and forth between working three-dimensionally, two-dimensionally, that, that two and a half D thing, but these are some works on paper that I did around that same time, and working in diptychs and the, the relationship between forms, but the way that I made these were very tactile, so I would paint on paper and then lay down tape, and then paint over the tape and pull the tape up, and sometimes the tape residue would stay. So very much like my paper, other paper pieces, like it's working with this language of, of residues and uh, accumulation of, of color layers on the surface. And these pieces were also included in the um, soft geometry show. And again, like these diptychs, but it, in, instead of them feeling kind of separated, they've merged or there's, they're physically woven together or the composition is passing over top of, of each other um, and looking to kind of the gesture of dyed materials and woven materials. Um, and kind of allowing them to again like saturate and desaturate on on the picture plane and then the last thing i'll talk about is just the last last summer um i did the artist exchange in dresden through the gcac um and right before i was going to go, be going on the residency like a month or two before i was approached by facebook to do a site specific installation at their corporate offices in chicago and they needed it done of course like really quickly two months later so i was thinking this residency was going to be time for me to just explore my work but it turned out to be a very heavy production mode of finishing this large scale um, installation for them um, so here's the artist rendering. Um, they kind of gave me some guidelines about, they really, they, with this project, and it's pretty interesting, they, they commission about five to seven artists per office that they have. And then they, they want artists to work um, in a very installation style, so they were not looking for discrete objects or s isolated paintings or, or pieces they wanted, they, they pushed back on my proposal and said, we want you to go more immersive. So, um, but you know, that was great. It's a great opportunity to kind of um, find that in my work and, and, and figure out like, what, what does that mean in my work? 
So here's just some initial images of setting up my studio in Dresden. And so I brought a lot of fabric from Columbus, um, but then I also bought fabric there. I would go to fabric stores and sometimes they would give me remnant fabric, so it's just like sourcing all the different colors that I was going to use. And then meanwhile, I was also doing some small drawings and painting those and kind of just as studies and, um, and forms that were relating to this project and the idea. Um, and then um, whenever I'm traveling anywhere doing residencies, I'm always paying attention to, again, like the landscape, whether it's urban or natural and the patterning that I'm seeing. Um, uh, in Dresden, there's a lot of like, cobblestone streets, brickwork, old brick, new brick, you know, as a city that was rebuilt after the war. So what does that tension look like within the, their built environment? So there's a lot of construction going on, but also in the midst of very old architecture and that, that new and old um, tension to me is pretty interesting. And so just paying attention to the patterning that it was seeing in the streets or walls or the that's the floor of the fabric store and that kind of worn path that's on the floor there. So, so yeah, I just um, started incrementally building these pieces and working on it. Um, and, um, you know, my family was with me, but my daughter was there for um, the second month. So my husband and I were working on this as as diligently as possible before Bell showed up, but just working in sections and, and also thinking about like, how how is this going to be realized in its final composition, which as people who've worked site specifically, it's like you have to kind of just generate the material and then go into the site hoping that you have more than enough so you can always edit back. But um, there's just like working in the studio every day and like, the cat, like the cat wandered in one day. Um, this was like a really great, the middle image, there was a box of um, thread from the flea market for 10 euros, which was like a super big score for me. And <laughs> I'm just like, so it's like, this is kind of like the mess of my studio where it's like just fabric strips and scraps everywhere. Um, and so just kind of using, and the studio space wasn't huge, uh, but like using up every single wall possible, just covering it with all these um, sections of fabric, trying to get to that end composition and that end amount of, of pieces that I would need for the, the installation. So it was really taking over, <laughs> being immersed in my, in my process here. Um, I like to include this too, because like, so just kind of commenting on the fact that, you know, I have a nine year old and that um, as a, artists and mom, like how do you balance all of that? But while she was with us in Germany, she was, she kind of was bored some of the time in the studio, but like this was a great day where I'm like, why don't you go around and do observational paintings of all the things in the studio? And so it was just like really great seeing her, um, her view of the studio and come through her, her paintings. So. Um, and then um, there, there were opportunities to have open studios and everyone's always just kind of like hanging out outside the storefronts and sitting out on the street and just getting to know the, the artists that were also working at the studio. There was another artist that um, is a fashion designer who was in the same studio space that lived there. So it's pretty quickly after I got back, uh, after we got back from Dresden, I had to go install this at, in Chicago. Um, and it was about a four day process. And um, I guess one of the tricky things about this install was that they didn't want any noise <laughs> until after six o'clock. <laughs> they got this like, like a library there. <laughs> so, and we had brought a staple gun compressor. So like we, I, I guess like the, the initial stages was just laying out the composition and getting that figured out. And then we went back at night to permanently affix it to the wall, so we ended up. This is kind of an interesting process for me as well in my work too, because I like the undulating surface of my textile pieces, but I also like this new kind of version where they're getting just flatly affixed to the wall surface. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, all these opportunities that you, you have to kind of problem solve, but then it brings new ideas into your work about like, well, that could be interesting to kind of follow that path and see what happens. Um, and then here's just some related pieces that I also worked on in Dresden. 
after I had finished the Facebook commission, um, and again, just thinking about these kind of evoking um, horizons or landscapes through abstract means in the textile pieces. And I think um, as I've been working more recently, and these are pieces that I made after coming back from Dresden, I think that the rectangular format is coming into my work. And it's, I don't know if that's just kind of like just exploring more of like a painterly approach, but um, that structure is kind of starting to repeat itself in my work, so I'm kind of paying attention to that right now. But um, so that's all I have, and then these are just some upcoming exhibitions. So right now I have this piece at Hammond Harkins in 6 plus 1, and then I'll have um, hopefully a large scale piece at the Columbus Museum of Art, part of the GCAC exhibition in June. I'm going back to Germany for a residency and exhibition um, in Berlin in July. So, yeah, well, that's all I have. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions or comments or yeah. I kind of like two questions. First one's real easy. Oh, good. Did you ever make like roll up magazine pieces as a kid? No. Oh. You know, you like rip strips but I, it seems like I would have, right? <laughs> yeah. But I know what you're talking about. I'm just curious about that. Yeah. The other one's a little more complex. Okay. Um, early on, you showed like these slides of like deconstructed pedestals that like really made me think about like minimalism and like sort of this Donald Judd kind of mm -hmm. existence yeah. and the like repressive nature of minimalism mm -hmm. as your like color kind of explodes from it. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you ever like kind of toying with or? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think also, I mean, I, I showed Eva Hess at the beginning and I think she is very much in that kind of pushback on, on the, I guess you're talking about like the masculinity of, of minimalism maybe, or, yeah, or kind, kind of, of the, like the lack of like, like human. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a cute. Like, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that I'm, I think I was pushing on that specifically of like, yeah, here's this kind of very, it's a kind of um, static, devoid, um, um, non-emotive object. And so what if I kind of push at that and crack it open and like, like I do that kind of like, what if imaginative thing of what could be in there that would be the, maybe the exact contrast of its exterior? I don't know, but yeah, I think it's definitely part of that conversation, sure. I have a question. Um, on your pieces of fabric, this is probably more processed, they look like a, like, like a brush stroke in a way, but they look mm -hmm. dimensional. Do you mm -hmm. put layers of, like on a red stroke, for instance, do you put mm -hmm. multiple pieces of red to give that dimensionality, then you stitch it? No, the, well, there's like a backing fabric, and then there's a, usually I use a lot of cotton. Um, so, but I think that the sewing process, the repeti I do a repetitive sewn a line, and then, and then the sections that come together make that un undulation, undulation happen to the surface. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's a good question though. Anybody else? I have another question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about your felt. Do you make your felt or? No. Joanne. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I get that a lot of like, and I, I, mean, I think that's why I got into dyeing or also the um, using screen printing on paper to make my own colors. It's like, what if you did that? Um, I've I've learned how to felt, but I haven't made my own felt. But that's like a whole other yeah. Or like, what if I made my own paper? What would that be like? Yeah. I still haven't gotten there yet, but I, it's something that I want to try at some point. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. You seem to use the like entire spectrum of yeah. the color palette. Is I there a dis yeah. of like conscious decision behind that or do you That's just like all the colors? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I think I started doing that as a way of just total like technic color assault in a way that you're I'm really mm -hmm. just kind of like assaulting the viewer with every color possible mm -hmm. and that that in itself like I talked about absorption or or how to kind of really immerse the viewer. And I think for me, that that's what does it. And it's just like an aesthetic that I really enjoy working with. Very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered using any textiles with any patterns 
Have you ever thought of like there's, how that could be incorporated? Yeah, I, I've thought about that. And there's a couple pieces where I have, but it's not very apparent. Or, or there'll be like a, because a, a lot of times, and we talked about this today, a lot of times people will give me fabric mm -hmm. and sometimes it has patterning to it. Okay. So I'll integrate that. But it, but I have thought about like, what if I used like an, an all striped fabrics? Like that would be cool, crazy. That'd be kind of interesting. Um, but I think within some of my pieces, I'm developing a striped patterning as it is. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know, like what would happen? You know, I think it's a really good mm -hmm. thing to think about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, Boreon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I find so I find it so interesting the correlations between like painting, um, especially in the surface and the brushstrokes Suzanne mentioned, because they seem so much like uh, the actual size of a large brush, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But with your early like grass work, you had so much larger like patches of color right and then yeah. um i don't know at which point like that shifted but it seems like a very consistent now approach mm -hmm. to the, the scale mm -hmm. of each individual um patch of color so mm -hmm. i was just kind of interested in, like what did it occur? yeah like was it gradual like, that's, yeah, that's a, a good bit about that that's something that i might not have the total answer to but i think the rectangle maybe developed as a very um, kind of efficient way where there's not a lot of, hopefully not a lot of scrap left over. So it's like you can cut a rectangle of fabric down and then it's just like these existing, it's like very straightforward versus generating the patches. Those were um, scraps that I had found. So it was kind of using just like found existing forms to then collage together. Um, but I do think it's like, I think with the rectangle, I feel like I can generate the movement more specifically, and it is very much like the kind of gesture of a brush stroke without, you know, I, I like talk about, I mean, I don't really talk about it today, but I feel like I'm a painter, but I don't use paint. Because right, right. <laughs> you know? they pulsate like a painting. Yeah, right. Those, but the uh, other work didn't do that, so yeah. it's like a really interesting visual shift. And I think I'm more drawn to tactility of materials versus Paint for me feels almost too direct, mm -hmm. maybe too um, too much of a kind of uh, commitment in a way. Yeah. Versus like with with a um, collage, you can kind of have that play that happens and then commit to it. <laughs> <or something. laughs> no, no, this is about my personality. But <laughs> I don't know. Thank so, you. Yeah. Anyone else? You yeah, mentioned. Oh, Ooh. More. You mentioned open screen printing. Yeah. Um, and I know what that is, but oh, I'm not yeah. sure if people know. That. Yeah, I didn't. I just assumed. So instead of burning an image onto a screen, I don't have any image on the screen, and then so I'll just push the color through. Cool. Yeah, like a like a marbling or kind of allowing it to to streak and squeegee onto the paper, so they're blending cool. together. Yeah, Fun. yeah, that's a good question. I also um, noticed your. Um, I realized when you were traveling, you were paying attention a lot about the building outside of the gallery space, mm -hmm. and then you were also no, you were also noticing um, how the place of the residency was affecting your work. Yeah. And your work is so colorful and so full of life. And I was wondering, why wouldn't you um, um, think about? like installing your work or like um, connecting your work with nature like mm -hmm. outside of the gallery space. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is just looking for opportunities like that to come up. Um, and I don't know, I think maybe I respond to the neutrality of the gallery space because then I can't, I'm controlling what color is happening versus in a natural setting, there's a lot of things that I that are out of my control, but um, I think that could be interesting to see, you know, what would happen in a natural environment too, so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.